So the topic tonight is, Will Not the God of Justice Do Right? It will probably come as no surprise that this topic will be a challenging one. We have to consider truth that is difficult to grasp. It's difficult to grasp because of our sin-tainted perspectives. We're going to think about the justice of God. And um, I've been very careful as we've been going along in our study of Job that we make sure we don't blame God for the suffering that Job is experiencing. God allowed it in his wisdom and in his sovereign plan. He allowed it for his name's sake, but it was not an act of justice. God himself did not bring about the disasters. He didn't bring the death and disease and suffering upon Job. Job and his friends, however, thought that the tragedies came from the Lord because they knew that God is a God of justice. So from their perspective, God was carrying out the retribution principle. Job couldn't understand why God was doing this. And the friends were saying it was because Job was a wicked, godless, hypocritical sinner. So that's the core message that we're seeing in, from Eliphaz in chapter 15 that we've just talked about. Eliphaz focuses on the justice of God against the wicked. So, it's important for us to remember and acknowledge that God is a God of justice. And as we think on the, this truth tonight, I'm also going to review the eternal destinations of all people. I brought this up and showed it to you last week in some charts. So, I'm going to review those charts and hopefully answer a few questions that were raised after my talk last week. To start with and remind you just in, its in uh, this passage of what Eliphaz said about the wicked. A wicked man reads in pain all his days. Few years are stored up for the ruthless. Dreadful sounds fill his ears. When he is at peace, a robber attacks him. He doesn't believe he will return from darkness. He is destined for the sword. He wanders about for food, saying, where is it? He knows the day of darkness is at hand. Trouble and distress terrify him overwhelming him like a king prepared for battle. For he has stretched out his hand against God and has arrogantly opposed the Almighty. He rushes headlong at him with his thick studded shields. This verse makes it clear how the wicked are towards God, arrogantly opposing the Almighty. It says that he has stretched out his hand, and this is a symbol of someone attempting to strike or shaking their fist at them. So it's a challenge or a threat. Arrogant opposition against the Lord. I want you to remember as we think about the God of justice tonight that the scriptures are inerrant and we are limited in our human wisdom. We also need to remember the glory of God, the whole of God's being. We have to remember that like all of God's attributes and everything that he does is in perfect harmony with himself. He is right in all that he does. He is perfect. He is holy. He is good. He is wise. He is infinitely wise. He is infinitely righteous. He is infinitely just. Across the top of your page, I just wanted you to have all the verses that I would be mentioning so you don't have to do anything with them, but that's why they're there. And here are some psalms that tell us about the justice of God. The Lord loves justice and does not forsake his godly ones. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked will be cut off. Psalm 45, 6 and 7, your throne, O God, is permanent. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Psalm 71, your justice, O God, extends to the skies above. You have done great things, O God. Who can compare to you? God carries out his justice through his discernment of the motives and behaviors of men and women. He knows exactly why people do what they do. And he sees exactly what people do. God is the perfect, comprehensive judge. He sees all the good and faithfulness that he will reward, and he sees all the sin and rebellion that he will punish, that he will judge. So I want to 
mention, remind you that God's justice is not just negative. He judges good to reward it. Believers will be judged, purified, and rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. And I was thrilled this morning when Pastor Davey talked about the judgment seat of Christ because I knew I had one sentence here. And they were like, that's a whole other lecture. And you got it this morning, which is really cool. So um, right now, tonight, we're going to focus on God's judgment and wrath against sin. God judged Adam and Eve. He expelled them from the garden. He put curses upon them. He judged the wicked people at the time of Noah with the flood that destroyed every living thing. And God judged Sodom and Gomorrah with something equivalent to a volcanic eruption. I want you to listen to the conversation that Abraham with, had with the Lord regarding Sodom and Gomorrah. Listen and read. <laughs> Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. That's what Abraham said to the Lord. So the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And then, the end of, and then Abraham and the Lord went back and forth, back and forth. And at the end of the conversation, Abraham said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak but once more. Suppose 10 should be found there. And the Lord said, I will not destroy it for the sake of of 10. The Lord loves righteousness and he hates sin. There were not 10 righteous in the city, the two cities. So it was destroyed. God is the true judge. He is the ultimate example for all the judges on the earth. To the idolatrous nation and the rebellious nation of Israel, he said through Ezekiel, my eye will not pity you. He said, I will not spare you. I'm going to hold you responsible for your behavior. You're going to suffer the consequences of your abominable practices. Now I will, upon you I will soon pour out my fury and spend my anger upon you. I will judge you according to your ways. Verse 9, my eye will not spare nor will I have pity. I will repay you according to your ways and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord who strikes. This is so hard to read. And I remember just being stunned as I studied this chapter of Ezekiel. At the same time that I was stunned, whoa, this is sober, this is serious. I also saw the sovereignty and the perfections of the Lord, which made his wrath and his judgment right. I want to show you what Revelation 19 says. After these things, John heard, as it were, a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. This verse is showing God being praised in heaven for his judgment against the great sin on the earth. Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God because his judgments are true and righteous. That was their response when they saw his judgment against the harlot Babylon. Well, now on your handout, I have quite a few statements. Um, and, you know, you're free not to fill it in. It's not required at all. But I will give you the fill in the blanks here as I go along. Wayne Grudem says, One of the great blessings of the final judgment will be that saints and angels will see the absolutely pure justice of God. And this will be a source of praise to him for all eternity. We can see that in Revelation 19. The pure justice of God. He carries out his justice against that which deserves the punishment. Grudem says, We must realize the immensity of the evil that is found in sin and rebellion against God. And we must realize the magnitude of the holiness and the justice of God that calls forth this kind of punishment. We have to get outside our little perspective and think about how big and great our God is. We do not know the extent 
of the evil done when sinners rebel against God. If God's greatness is unsearchable, which it is, then we cannot grasp how horrible sin is against him. And Grudem quotes David Kingdom, and he says, Sin against the Creator is heinous to a degree utterly beyond our sin-warped imagination's ability to conceive of. Who would have the boldness to suggest to God what the punishment should be? God knows what the right punishment is for sin against him. And um, Grudem says, um, yep, <laughs> unpunished evil detracts from God's glory in the universe, but when God does punish evil and he triumphs over it, the glory of his justice, righteousness, and power to triumph over all opposition will be seen, and he will be praised for his victory over sin and evil. So God's justice, when he brings it about, is going to give him greater glory, more glory. Romans 9, 22, 23 says, What if God, although willing to demonstrate his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And he did so in order that he might make known the riches of his glory upon vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. So let me restate this as Grudem did. The depth of the riches of God's mercy will also then be revealed. For all redeemed sinners will realize well, they'll recognize that they too deserve such punishment from God and have avoided it only by God's grace through Jesus Christ. This is the kind of thing you just need to sit and think about. <laughs> because there is an eternal, unchangeable requirement in the holiness and justice of God that sin be paid for. Our sin against God must be paid for. Isaiah prophesied about this when he prophesied about Jesus. Isaiah 53.10 says it was the Lord's good plan to crush him and cause him grief. Jesus' life is made an offering for sin. It was the will of the Lord to crush Jesus. It was God's justice that required that sin be paid for. And it was God the Father who required that payment. The pain and suffering that God himself endured when he carried out his justice upon his son. He knows the depth and the gravity of his justice. And he paid the price by pain in watching what his son had to endure. God's judgment on the wicked of the earth during the flood and upon Sodom and Gomorrah and upon Israel for its idolatry was severe. It was extreme. It was horrible. And it was appropriate. But all of that was nothing compared to the wrath of God that was poured out on his beloved son on the cross for the sins of his people. So the Lord exhausted his, ra his wrath, he exhausted his rage on Christ, and his justice was satisfied at the sacrificial death of Jesus. Romans 3.23 tells us, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. These verses are loaded. Propitiation is the act of offering an appropriate sacrifice to turn away the wrath of God. To finish it. To satisfy it. Hebrews 2.17 says that Christ made the propitiation for the sins of the people. He offered himself to God so that God's wrath would be removed from us. And Bruce Demarest says, By giving Jesus as a substitutionary sacrifice, God was able to, one, remain true to his holy nature that cannot overlook sin. Two, he was able to uphold his law 
which stipulates that sin be punished by death. And three, God was able to mercifully acquit sinners who were deserving of death. This is so hard and yet so amazing. And there's so much to be thankful for. And we sang about it this morning. The, the songs that we were singing, I'm forever grateful, and God's wrath was satisfied. We were singing these words this morning. Hebrews 9.27 says, It is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. So with the perfect justice of God in mind, I want to review what happens to people when they die. And there were a few questions from my charts last week, so I'll work some answers in with new I mean, the same charts in different ways. Okay, first of all, during Old Testament times, the spirits of those who had faith in God and lived a life like Job, who were fearing God and turning from evil and walking uprightly, they trusted that their salvation would come from the Lord. They would go to the righteous compartment of Sheol. So I showed you this picture. Sheol is the Hebrew word. Hades is the Greek word. Sheol has a righteous compartment, a a compartment for the unrighteous or wicked. It's separated by a great chasm. We know that Job expected to go to Sheol. He's mentioned it. <laughs> That's why we're talking about it. Other Old Testament people talked about it too. Jacob said in Genesis 37, after Joseph was sold off by his brothers, Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for his son many days. Then all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, surely I will go down to Sheol in mourning for my son. Samuel was apparently in Sheol also when Saul tricked a sorcerer into calling him up. And from 1 Samuel 28, the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And Saul said, Bring up Samuel. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? You're Saul. The king said, Don't be afraid. What did you see? The woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, what is his form? And she said, an old man is coming up and he's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. And Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Now he doesn't say, why did you bring me up from Sheol? But it certainly fits the description of Sheol. And what our understanding is that there was a place for the righteous of the Old Testament where they were their spirits were and David said in Psalm 16 you will not to the Lord he said you will not leave my soul in Sheol so that's a few examples of Old Testament men who one was in Sheol others were expecting to go to Sheol at Christ's death the full wrath of God was poured out and Christ's substitutionary death and sacrifice paid the full penalty for the sins of the Old Testament saints. Their sins had only been temporarily covered by confessions of sin and sacrifices and their anticipation of salvation through the Lord and his Messiah. So again, looking back at Romans 3.25, it said that God in his divine forbearance passed over former sins. So now, with all sins completely dealt with, the paradise compartment of Sheol could be relocated to heaven and into the presence of the Lord. So that's a change that happens because of Christ's death on the cross. What verses indicate this? Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Assuredly, today you will be with me in paradise. And Ephesians 4.8 says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. To lead captivity captive is to rescue prisoners and lead them out of their captivity. There are a lot of interpretations of this verse, but it's understood by many to indicate that Jesus took those who had been captive in the righteous compartment of Sheol and led them to heaven to be with him there. And now I want to switch a little bit from thinking about Old Testament saints and this 
it's all it's all related <laughs> but um, I want to mention that there are versions of the Apostles Creed that say that Jesus Jesus was crucified dead and buried then he descended to hell and then on the third day he rose from the dead ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty so the Apostles Creed says he uh, descended into hell did he did Jesus descend into hell well, I have to say yes and no. So, um, some teach that Jesus went to hell for three days before he was resurrected. And some teach that Jesus suffered in hell. So that's where, no, that is wrong. He did not. Jesus' statement to the dying thief was, Today you will be with me in paradise. And the clincher is John 19.30, where Jesus received the sour wine, and then he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. When he said, it is finished, he didn't mean, it's almost finished, I have to go suffer a little bit more. But it is finished. The justice of God, the judgment of God against sin, the wrath of God against sin was finished. There was no need for any other suffering. And there was a physical uh, example that happened at the moment of his death the veil in the temple tore from top to bottom the holy of holies was opened up that showed us the way to the lord has been opened through the blood of christ it is finished so nothing else was required for jesus to suffer or endure i'm kind of passionate about that <laughs> so why do people think that jesus descended into hell well, there's this verse in Ephesians 4, right after that other, oops, I'm already there. Um, after 8 comes 9, and it says, well, he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth. This phrase is interpreted two ways. It can either be seen as Jesus descending to Sheol, or um, that Jesus descended to the earth, that God became a man. This was the incarnation of Jesus. Well, it is possible that this is referring to Jesus descending to the righteous compartment of Sheol to release those captives and take them to heaven with him. There's another passage that gives that tells us of how Jesus might have interacted with those in Sheol. Not how, but that he did, actually. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 20. Another passage that's extremely difficult to interpret, and I'm looking forward to when Pastor Davey gets to this chapter. So listen in when he, um, I haven't checked this with him. <laughs> All right. Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through the water. There are spirits in prison. Well, what are those spirits? These are spirits that are connected with the time of Noah. Those are the spirits that are talked about in 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude 1, 6. Angels who sinned that God put in Tartarus, the pits of darkness, and kept them and is still keeping them there in chains until their final judgment. Jude 1, 6, the angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode. That's definitely those bad angels at the time of Noah. He has reserved an everlasting change under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So what does First Peter say that Jesus did about this? It says, he preached to the disobedient spirits of Noah's day. He made a proclamation to them. The Greek word is caruso. He didn't go evangelize them. He didn't go give good news to them. This was not a salvation message. This was a proclamation of his victory over all things. It also is not a descent into hell to suffer or to stay there. It even makes sense if we just are trying to figure this out, that Jesus goes to the Old Testament saints, the righteous compartment, to relieve, relieve them, release them from their captivity, and in doing so, he's making a proclamation to the spirits who are in Tartarus, because based on the 
uh, explanation that Jesus gives us in Luke, we know that they could see across that chasm. They cannot cross the chasm, but the rich man could see Lazarus in Abraham's bosom. The rich man in torment could see Lazarus. So the final word on whether Jesus descended into hell is that there is nothing in any of these passages that says Jesus descended to suffer further for sin. It's all clear as mud, right? <laughs> Let's think about good news now. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. It is finished, and so at the time of our death, our bodies go into a casket, or they're cremated, or they're buried at sea, or given for medical science, or perhaps your organs are going to give someone else life if they need healthy organs. And because our sin has been judged on the cross and we're forgiven, our spirits go immediately to the presence of the Lord in heaven. So this is the timeline picture of the blue being the grave where bodies are kept and the yellow is Old Testament paradise which was then relocated to heaven with the Lord and now we are after that vertical blue and yellow line, we live after the cross so if we die right now, our spirits go to paradise with the Lord. And the spirit is the guarantee of this. And then when Jesus calls us at rapture, he will give us a new, restored, glorified body. I gave you verses from 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians 4 last week. Wherever our bodies are, whatever condition they're in, Jesus is going to have no problem putting all the cells back together. And they'll be in a new and improved design. It'll be the best makeover ever. Those who are living, you know, they get an instant perfection, extreme makeover, and we'll all be gathered together uh, in Christ. And that's the time when the judgment seat of Christ will happen. So what we heard about this morning would happen immediately upon that time of rapture. And then we'll be in heaven. And after the tribulation, we... Saints with glorified bodies will descend with Christ. So there's a blue up at the top. There's an arrow down. That's Jesus and us. And then after 1,000 years of reigning with Christ on the earth, we are with the Lord forever. But Satan's and his demons will be released from the abyss. And that's the red arrow being released to the earth, but then they are crushed. The satanic rebellion is crushed. They are sent to the lake of fire. And my last comments are about the final judgment of eternity, which will take place. Our God of justice reigns at the great white throne. This was mentioned this morning as well. Revelation 20 describes it. Uh, verse 11, I saw a great white throne and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So, we are to fear our Lord, to trust him. He is the God of perfect justice. His justice is good. His justice is is worthy of glory and we will give him more glory we will praise him when we see him carry out his justice in the end these are hard concepts to grasp to wrestle with the wrath of God and the goodness of God um, but we just need to we need to acknowledge our limitations and trust the perfections of our God